<laughs> this is Pet Life Radio. Let's talk pets. This show is brought to you by Pet King Brands, the makers of Zymox and Oratine. It's OBA with Arden Moore, the show that teaches you how to have harmony in the household with your pets. Join Arden as she travels coast to coast to help millions better understand why cats and dogs do what they do. Get the latest scoop on famous faces. They're perfectly pampered pets in Who's Walking Who in Rin Tin Tinseltown. From famous pet experts and best-selling authors to television and movie stars, you'll get the latest buzz from wagging tongues and tails. Garner great pet tips and have a doggone fur-flying fun time. So get ready for the pause and applause as we unleash your all-behave host, America's pet edutainer, Arden Moore. Welcome to the Old Behave Show on Pet Life Radio. I'm your host, Arden Moore. Hey, in a perfect world, all of our pets would be problem free. And we, as pet parents, would possess the skills of pet detectives by finding uh ohs in our pets early so they can get quicker treatments. Does that sound like a far-fetched dream? Well, not to our special guest today. I mean, he has dedicated his entire professional career for bringing out the healthy best in pets and helping be our guru, if you will, in unleashing great pet health and behavior advice. Now, his credentials will make you say, bow, wow, I mean, lots of letters after his name. But for now, let's all give a warm welcome, give pause and applause to the remarkable and inspiring Dr. Lowell Ackerman. Hey, welcome to the show, Dr. Lowell. Arden, I'm I'm happy to be here. All right, all right. Hey, the good doctor is a highly credentialed veterinarian. He has immensely strong typing fingers as he's written dozens, that's with an S, of books. Uh, Some are aimed at his veterinary colleagues. So they have big words and they hurt your head, but they're good. And others, including ones we'll talk about today, are for us, pet parents. So we're going to dive in, but we have to pay for the show by taking a commercial break. So you all know the drill. Sit and stay. We'll be right back. Time for a walk on the red carpet, of course. All Behave will be back in a flash right after these messages. Take a bite out of your competition. Advertise your business with an ad in Pet Life Radio podcasts and radio shows. There is no other pet-related media that is as large and reaches more pet parents and pet lovers than Pet Life Radio. With over 7 million monthly listeners, Pet Life Radio podcasts are available on all major podcast platforms. And our live radio stream goes out to over 250 million subscribers on iHeartRadio, Odyssey, TuneIn, Stitcher, and other streaming apps. For more information on how you can advertise on the number one pet podcast and radio network, visit PetLifeRadio.com slash advertise today. Let's Talk Pets on PetLifeRadio.com. All Behave is back with more tail-wagging ways to achieve harmony in the household with your pets. Now back to your fetching host, America's pet edutainer, Arden Moore. Welcome back to the All Behave Show on Pet Life Radio. I'm your host, Arden Moore. With us today is Dr. Lowell Ackerman. Now, he's got a lot of titles after his name. Enough to fill a bowl of alphabet soup. I mean, he's board certified in a lot of areas of veterinary medicine, but he is also the head of global veterinary strategy. We'll talk about that a little bit. And he has a publishing company that's called what else? Problem free publishing. I mean, come on. He says it like it is. So what we're going to do, Dr. Lowe, you ready for this? You and I have been buddies, gosh, I think like 20 years now, right? A long time, Arden, a long time. Now, years ago, when we were both just pups, we actually (laughs) did write a little book together. That was kind of fun. And I always run into you at veterinary conferences. Listeners, I got to tell you, this is the kindest, brainiest man I have ever known. And he is there for us and he's there for our pets. And what is it about you and uh, writing books? I mean, seriously, I'm a writer. I kind of know my motivation, but you never just stop. Have you ever sat down? figured out how many books you actually wrote, co-authored, or edited? Yeah, Arden, it's a lot. I think on last count, it's about 85. 
Oh my gosh. What is it about it? I know for me, I love to be a student and a teacher and I love to share good knowledge. What is it for you? Well, it's exactly the same. Uh, when I see animals in the clinic, I can address problems on a one-on-one -on -one basis. When I lecture, I can uh, address, you know, a group of hundreds. But when I write books, it can actually touch the lives of thousands and thousands of people. Yeah, they could be reading it at 3 a.m. Absolutely. That's a good way to do it. Well, listeners, you're in for a treat because we're going to kind of dive into a couple of his newer books that were written, of course, during COVID, because what else can you do but crank out some more books? The one we're going to spend a lot of time in that I really like, it's called Problem Free Pets. It's the ultimate guide to pet parenting. And speaking of the word parenting, Dad, who helped write that book with you? Well, since you asked Arden, I'm going to tell you that uh, I co-wrote that with my daughter, Rebecca. I remember when she was a teenager. Now she's got uh, a college degree and, and uh, she's just growing and going like you are, right? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Oh. It brings a lot of that youthful energy to the book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is what I like about this book. You sort of compare having a pet to a car analogy, because when we get a car, there's always a maintenance schedule. And in your book, you said that pets need the same approach. So talk about that, because I know when I need to get my oil changed on my car, check my tires, things like that. But in a way, we need to have that same mindset, don't we, for our pets? We really do. And, you know, it, it, when we talk about maintenance schedules, it's not a really a very sexy kind of term, <laughs> but really kind of spells out that thing. I mean, you know, when you get a car, you anticipate the maintenance schedule is going to be different for a Ferrari than yeah. it is for a Toyota, right? Right. We just know that different vehicles are going to have different requirements. And so do different pets of different breeds, uh, different living circumstances, animals that uh, do certain activities. Yep. They're just going to have different risk factors and the kind of routine maintenance they're requiring is going to be different. It's going to be unique and novel, as unique and novel as the individual pet. And so our care needs to be customized. Puppies and kittens aren't born with owner's manuals. That's I mean, right. there's people like you and I that write the books. But when you buy a Ferrari or a Toyota, you get this huge, thick owner's manual down to all the little safety doodads. And yet we have this beautiful makes our lives better in so many ways without an owner's manual coming at us. Yeah. And, and the fact is, you know, for ourselves and our children, we have the equivalent, right? So we right. know when we raise children, what vaccines they're going to need when they go to elementary school and what kind of things they need when they're teenagers and what they need when they go off to college and right. know when we should start doing mammograms and when we should start doing colonoscopies. Fun. So our, yeah. None of those things are fun, but right. we, even to the very basic level, how often we should go to the dentist or how often we should brush teeth, all of those things are incredibly routine and engraved. And, uh, and because of that, we don't ignore them. Now, to be truthful, a lot of people do ignore right. <laughs> what they should be doing. But we're trying to get the perfect, almost perfect pet. Right. So, so to get the almost perfect pet, which is, by the way, uh, another book title. <laughs> That's right. Say the full name of that one, if you would. It's Almost Perfect Pets, A Proactive Guide to Selection, Healthcare, and Pet Parenting. I love it. I love it. So let's go with this because in your book, you said that having a problem free pet is three things. It should be an attitude. It should be a philosophy. It should be a mantra. I like that. So you said you got to have a plan, but it, not just any plan, a pet specific plan. So right. can you give me an example on the dog and the cat side where there may be little things about them, that particular pet that would make it more, let's dive in to be more specific. Sure. So first of all, all animals will have different risk factors. So, you know, an animal that, for instance, attends a lot of activities where it's exposed yeah. to other animals or, you know, you're doing hospital visits or things like that, you're going to want to be very, very clear, not only on the behavioral aspects of training, 
but that it's parasite free, that it has been, you know, appropriately vaccinated. Yep. All of those sorts of things. If you are boarding your pet. Oh, with good point. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of OS's at the end of the names that you could get canine cooties or kitty cooties. Right. We often also don't take into consideration when people go on vacation with their pets and take them outside of their immediate geographic areas, right? So you might say, well, we don't have this disease in our area, so we don't vaccinate for it. But then you find out, well, they're actually spending three months of the year somewhere else in the country where they would be exposed. Yeah, you actually, you gave an example in the book, like you have, you and your, your dog live in, say, Tucson, Arizona, and the dog after a walk is kind of limping and you think it might be arthritis, but you're saying in your book, which I thought was brilliant, that you have to factor in the geography. And so the vet team would also screen for what maybe? So one of the things that we see in that part of Arizona that we don't see in most other parts of the country is a condition that locals call valley fever. Okay. But it's actually a fungal disease caused coccidioidomycosis. Oh, say it again. It sounds so good. Oh, coccidioidal mycosis. You know, I think to be a veterinarian, you have to be a linguist and a spelling bee champ. (laughs) Well, that's why everybody else just calls it valley fever. Thank goodness. Thank goodness. Well, all right. So you brought up something good because many of us have cabin fever, not valley fever, and we're ready to get out and take a doggy vacay. I'm going to be doing that with Julie, with Kona and Emma. Um, Fortunately, we're kind of going in the same geographical area. It's only like a two or three hour away. But if we were going from Texas to Florida or Texas to New Mexico, I think this is really important. You really do have to kind of pay attention to what some of the things that might be geographically uh uh-ohs for our pets. Right. And really all you need to do is apprise your veterinary team, because if you don't talk to your veterinary team, you don't need to know that valley fever is in Arizona. No, that's right. You need to know that when you're talking to your veterinarian, you're making sure they're aware of all the potential risk factors for your pet, including where you might travel with your pet. Yeah. So if you live in Alaska, the risk heartworm disease is really quite low. Right. But I live in Texas. It's quite... (laughs) Yeah. And the other kind of things that tend to get glossed over are the breed specific risk factors. Okay. Right. And those are really very important because like there's a lot of things we can do and we can avoid, right? So we can avoid certain things if we can sort of control what we're exposing a pet to, Mm -hmm. but we can't avoid its family history. And when you go in to see your own physician, okay. They do a health risk assessment, which is another non-sexy term, but very, very important in healthcare. Yes, it is. It's going to ask you questions like, do you have a family history of heart disease? Right. That's Is there any family history of cancer? And they'll ask other questions about, you know, how much alcohol do you drink? Do you smoke? We don't worry about that so much with our pets, but those are risk factors so that the physician can say, all right, these are the kind of things we need to be monitoring for. Okay. Well, let's dive in, give some examples on the dog and the cat side. So I know in your book, you talked about purebreds, mixed breeds. And then the hybrid breeds. Right. Uh, let's talk about what would be a risk factor for brachiocephalic breeds, you know, like the pug or the bulldog or on the cat side, the Persian or the Himalayan. Right. So the brachycephalics or those that have kind of a squashed face, you know, often have a much higher risk. It's not inevitable, but it's a much higher risk of things that like brachycephalic syndrome or a respiratory problem because, you know, their whole breathing apparatus is compressed. Uh And uh, actually, sometimes I don't know if you've ever had the opportunity, Arden, if you go to a veterinary conference, sometimes they have masks you can put on your face that simulates what it would be like to try to breathe if you were a pug. I have not had that opportunity. Where have that pug mask been all my life? I know it's actually a really interesting thing because what it does is it increases the resistance. Okay. And some people may feel this when they have their masks on from COVID. Oh yeah. There you (laughs) go. And they go, that's only a tiny bit about what your pug or Boston Terrier, uh, you know, maybe, or Himalayan may be feeling trying to pull air into their respiratory tract. 
And so that's very real. And we don't even think of that as a genetic or hereditary disease. We just think of it as a confirmation problem that if you have. But I'm thinking if you have a hot day, aren't those the type of dogs and cats that might have a little trouble from a higher risk for heat stroke because they're not able to breathe as well as, say, a beagle? Um, yeah, you're, you're definitely going to have problems, not even just on hot days, but anything that involves exertion. Oh, so okay. it's hard to take them for a long walk. It's hard to take them if you're using sometimes a regular collar. Oh, yeah. I'm a harness gal. Yeah, I'm a harness guy, too. But, you know, you can really see That's in some of these point. brachycephalics that the extra pressure on their neck from a leash is too much. And wow. you hear them like hacking and honking and. Uh, and all of that. So yeah, th those are really clear. But what some people don't think about are equally pressing. So that uh, let's say something like you have a Cavalier King Charles Spaniel. Yes, they uh, call them dog. the love sponge. And they really are. Yeah. But sometimes people are taken aback that by the time they're five years of age, almost 50% of them have heart disease. That is sad. What a bad, bad, bad gene in there. <laughs> bad gene. Go away. <laughs> yeah. Right? And, and so part of it is, you know, when we're trying to have almost perfect pets. Okay. And Good. Cavalier King Charles Spaniels are definitely can be almost perfect. Oh, pet, yeah. Is you need to be aware of those risk factors because you don't want to suddenly discover they have heart disease when you take them for a walk and they collapse on the driveway. Really good point. Hey, everyone, we're, we're speaking with Dr. Lowell Ackerman. He is a best selling author. He is a multi credentialed certified veterinarian, and somehow he found time to get an MBA from Harvard. He's a great guy, and he's really on a mission to help all of us have almost perfect pets. We're going to plunge in a little bit deeper after we take this commercial break. So sit, stay, we'll be right back. Time for a walk on the red carpet, of course. All Behave will be back in a flash right after these messages. Hey, pet pals, Arden Moore here. Itch, scratch, rub, chew, repeat. Does that sound like what's happening to your pet? Help is here. Zymox skin and ear care products can help calm and soothe your pet's angry skin or red infected ears. For over 20 years, Zymox products have been helping pets find relief for these conditions. For that itchy pet, Zymox shampoo and leave-on conditioner combines a special blend of ingredients to help moisturize, hydrate, and provide soothing relief. For those hard to treat areas like body folds or the paws, easy to use Zymox topical cream and spray are great options. And for those nasty ears, Zymox ear solution is awesome. And you don't even have to pre-clean the painful ear. No pre-cleaning? Hooray! All Zymox skin and ear products get their effectiveness from enzymes. Zymox contains no antibiotics and no petroleum byproducts. Just the soothing power of enzymes. Zymox can be found at your veterinary clinic, most pet specialty stores, and online. Hey, you can save 20% off any Zymox or Oratine product on Zymox.com by using the code ARDEN20 at checkout. That's ARDEN20. Visit Zymox.com. That's Z-Y-M-O-X.com. More great news. You now can also save 20% off any Zymox ear or skin product on the exclusive deals page on FearFreeHappyHomes.com. Pause up. Let's talk pets. Let's talk pets. On Pet Life Radio. Pet Life Radio. PetLifeRadio.com. Holy hound dog. Hi, this is Burt Ward, and you're listening to the OB Cave Show with Arden Moore on Pet Life Radio. Listen every week, same pet time, same pet channel. We're back from the lot. Just checked the paper, and we had a record showing at the box. The letterbox, that is. Now back to OB Cave. Here's Arden. Welcome back to the O Behave Show on Pet Life Radio. I'm your host, Arden Moore. I am jazzed that we have Dr. Lowell Ackman on our show. We have been friends for two decades. He can talk like big words, 
and little words and either way it's clear it's concise and it's informative and i've had the opportunity to meet his family you're a good guy how do you like that for a title you're a good guy yeah i appreciate that arden that's not a bad title to have right <laughs> So we talked a little bit about risk factors, like if you're a cavalier or you are brachycephalic breeds, even gender in your book. I want to I got to shout it out again. Problem free pets, the ultimate guide to pet parenting. You co-authored with your daughter, Rebecca Ackerman. But uh, in your book, you talked about chicks, dogs, cats. Um, they may have more risk for a certain thing, which you'll identify whether the boy dogs and the boy cats because of this one x chromosome oh did i sound good there did i sound like i was doing my homework i love that Arden. yeah i try i try you bring up my game man um <laughs> let's talk about gender wise that maybe people don't realize that could also be something to keep tabs on well i'll, I'll do that arden and i'm gonna tease you for just a second that All right, i can take it even new aspects that are gender related that a few years ago, most veterinarians were not aware of. Really? So that's a little teaser. I'm gonna answer your question first, but then let's get okay. back to that. I got it as a little, don't forget. All right. So yeah, so it, it should be no surprise that that boy dogs and cats have different parts. Oh, daddy, are you gonna tell me the birds and the bees? Yeah. The neuter so birds and bees. <laughs> So obviously, if we're talking about prostate problems, we're talking about males. But when we're talking about things like mammary cancers, oh yeah, right, we're uh, or breast cancers, we're we're talking about the females, and those are can be very very important because especially when it comes to some of these, we can determine them based on the age at which we neuter our pets. Oh, right, okay. we can control that. So, you know, if we, you know, in general, I'm saying in general, because right. every pet needs to be treated as an individual. And these books are really designed around that. Yeah, you're being pet specific plans. That's what you I read in the pages. Like That's kind of the theme. So we have very different things that are related to the boy and girl parts. And I think everyone immediately can appreciate that. Right. Yeah. Okay. My female dog's not going to have a prostate. I don't have to worry about prostate disease or, you know, or, or any of those sorts of things. Okay. We also have things that are gender limited, Oh, but aren't necessarily related. So for instance, cryptorchidism in dogs, which is really common. What is that? And that is, that is when the testicles don't descend oh. fully. It's actually a really common uh, yeah. problem. I'm glad I've never people. had that problem. Okay. Yeah, I'm glad you've never had that problem. Arden. Okay. But on breeding animals, it's a big problem. Oh yeah. Because yeah. it's, there is a hereditary basis to it. Okay. Now, you know, you might want to think, well, it has to do with the testicles descending. It's got to be transmitted on the Y chrome on the man's chromosome. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's actually no evidence that that's true. Oh, wow. So no evidence that it's, on the X chromosome either. And so there are certain things that we only see in one gender, but not in the other. Okay. But that doesn't mean that they're transmitted genetically that way. Wow. That makes sense. The plot thickens. The plot thickens. All right. So the teaser item I was telling you about, okay. and I'm not going to go into specific details because I don't want people to jump on that. But when it comes to neutering, okay. one of the things that veterinary studies have shown over the last several years is that the optimal age for neutering a pet depends on its breed, Good. depends on its gender, and depends on its risks of other problems like orthopedic disease. Oh. That actually in some breeds, we shouldn't be neutering them at six months of age because we can, while we'll lower the risk of breast cancer in, in those animals, we may actually increase the risk of certain other problems. So it's actually kind of a complicated matrix uh, yeah. that we developed to say, what is the breed? What is the gender? And are they at risk for hip dysplasia or other sorts of problems? And let's figure the optimal age. Is that message kind of getting to the veterinarians that are now in small animal practices, as well as those that are in animal shelters? Yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting thing. That information is so new. Okay. 
that I would not be surprised if many veterinarians haven't had the opportunity to learn about it yet. This is just special for your listeners. Aren't we glad, listeners? You just got a scoop from Dr. Lowell Ackerman. Yeah. So, yes, that is really very cutting edge, uh, cutting uh, term research uh, that's been done that's shown that we can actually plan the optimal time. And that's kind of like why we need to be customizing care rather than going, oh, yeah, we just vaccinate all dogs at this age and we neuter all animals at this age and we do this for all dogs and we do this for all yeah. cats. We don't do this for all humans. We do not. And we these are our four legged buds that are keeping us That's sane. Right. Hey, I know we're going to say this at the end of the show too, but what's the best way people can get their paws on your books? Where would you direct them to go? Because you have 85 and counting books. Some are for veterinarians. Some are for us pet parents. Where would you steer them so they could look at your litany of, of books? Well, the easiest place is on Amazon or any of the online book things. You can actually just put my name in and there'll be a raft of ones that come up. So Almost Perfect Pets is McFarland Press, but virtually all of the books are available online from your favorite online. I like it. Well, I just got to ask the, the maybe the basic question, but it's an important one because you have a lot to share with people. And speaking of trends, like you just did with your gender tease to me, I know that with COVID, a lot of us were parked in uh, veterinary parking lots as yes. our pets were escorted in. And you write about the rise of telehealth and also of pet portals. So let's dive into those things because with our pets, we have things on apps now and maybe we're not leaving our home. So what's your take? Explain what telehealth is and pet portals, and then let's talk about them. Sure. So uh, telehealth exists when you communicate with your veterinary team, whether it's by mm, telephone, whether you're doing it through an app, you know, whether you're doing it through Zoom, uh, however you're doing it, that you're communicating. Probably the most important thing about telehealth is that, you know, as most people probably know, veterinary clinics are busy places. And so you need to kind of understand the rules of telehealth. So does my clinic offer telehealth? Do they offer it kind of on demand or are there certain time slots that I need to be available to, to do a telehealth visit. The other thing is to kind of be aware about, and this is sometimes difficult, about what sort of things reasonably could be handled with a telehealth visit and what's just beyond that. So what's a couple of clear cut things that you would benefit by doing telehealth? And what are a couple muddy, uh oh, we don't know for sure. Yeah. So, you know, as you can imagine, you know, if uh, something happens and your pet collapses, <laughs> yeah. that's a difficult thing to handle by telehealth, right? No, because yeah. <laughs> you just don't have any tools available to you at home, but there's lots of other things. So, you know, if you're uh, suspecting that you've got flea issues or if there's a skin problem and you would just like somebody to take a look at it and say, yeah, I can handle that by phone or no, it's something you need to bring into the clinic. Okay. You just kind of need to be prepared that obviously if blood tests are required or x-rays are required, that's not the kind of thing that can be handled with a telehealth visit. No, we're not in the Star Trek era yet where you can beam me up a, a bladder draw. Yeah. So it's important to have realistic expectations. I mean, everybody would like to avoid going into the clinic, but really what telehealth is for is an easy thing to allay your apprehension. Because sometimes when people come into a veterinary clinic, their first thing is, am I just wasting your time? Should I have not bothered bringing my pet in? Yeah, that's true. And, and also after hours where it's very expensive and you don't know for sure, and you have to go to an emergency room and they will even say, hey, here's your big bill, but come to your, see your vet tomorrow. So it seems like it might be a good economic and worrier helper if you could have a telehealth chat before you automatically go to an ER clinic because it's after hours. A absolutely. So as long as pet owners have reasonable expectations, so you're going to pay for a telehealth consult, it may or may not save you a trip to the veterinarian. Good. That's good to know. May, yeah, it's good to know. And you need to feel comfortable 
Okay. That Okay. Well, I saved my trip to the veterinarian because, you know, they advised me that I could do this at home or it's not an emergency. It could wait or, or whatever. Right. So, I mean, that's important, but, you know, to give a, a rough idea, there are a lot of things that can be handled with a telehealth visit, especially if there are questions about adjusting medication right. or quick look at things or questions about behavioral consequences. Or even a post-surgery checkup, you know? How's the Absolutely. Yeah, I Absolutely. agree. Those are the things that can be handled. So you should think about it that if this was you, is it something that could be handled with a telehealth visit with your own physician? I like and that's that. usually a fairly good guideline as to whether or not it would be satisfactory for your pet. Now, the other thing you discuss in your book is pet portals. Now, I'm going to give you a second. I have a medical portal for me. I don't have any real health issues, but I do have a headache after I was diving in and setting it all up and everything. But it's kind of the way of the world now. What are pet portals and what's your your take on them? So pet portals are exactly the same. Pet portals are where you keep your pet health information online. And I'll give you a typical thing. You, you may very well have experienced this, Arden, that when you end up at an emergency clinic, yeah, and they say something like, okay, what, what were the results of the last bloods that your veterinarian ran three months ago? You're likely going to go, I don't oh, know. <laughs> I don't know. Um, so the pet portal is your place to keep all that information. You okay. can access it on your phone. You can say, all right, I don't exactly know, but here I can call up for you what the results were, that sort of thing. So it's really just meant to be this is my online repository. Now, some of the other things that can be really handy out of a pet portal is if your pet goes missing, because oh, many yes. pet portals will have things that say, I, you can print out a notice if you want to go through your neighborhood and, and post things that have your pet's picture and what their microchip information is and, and all of that kind of stuff. I like it. Hey, we got to wrap up soon, but this book. Is it over already? Arden? Isn't it? What, what do you think? Isn't it cool? Oh we're going to have to have you. We're going to have you back. That's not a problem because <laughs> I think you have other things you could talk about. But there's another book out there, guys. I want you to pay attention to of his many books. It's new, just like Problem Free Pets. This one is 459 pages, but it's worth it. And it's called Proactive Pet Parenting, Anticipating pet health problems before they happen. And what I like about that is you kind of have a template format where you've kind of give an overview and all, and then you list a lot of different conditions and kind of give us a little take on them and then say what breeds are more susceptible. That had to kill a few brain cells in that book for you. Yeah. Well, I've been tracking that information for decades. Um, but it's in a very sort of convenient way. So you probably wouldn't be surprised that even many veterinarians aren't familiar with relatively rare conditions right. that okay. have a hereditary basis in animals. So things like trapped neutrophil syndrome, you know, you might go, I, I was just talking about that the other day, <laughs> not exactly. But you know what, you can go into proactive pet parenting and read one paragraph about it. It goes, oh, that's what it is. Oh, and those are the breeds that are affected by it. And you can also flip to another appendix at the back and look up whatever your breed is, and it'll list. Yes, I love the way it's the organized. Susceptibilities yeah. for that. So it, it doesn't do a deep dive, really. It's uh, just an overview for people who want to know how to handle it. I know one thing I'm not taking you on in a finger wrestling, even though I've been a journalist all my life. I don't know. I think I met my match. I think your typing fingers are pretty darn strong. Um, folks, before we go, he also is head of global veterinary strategy. What does that mean? Yeah, I'm uh, head of global veterinary strategy at uh, Galaxy Vets, which is a veterinary consolidator. And, uh, you know, my role is to try to make sure that everything we do for pets and everything we do as far as training veterinarians and veterinary staff has to do with being able to customize care to the needs of the individual pet. I like that. I like that. What do you do for fun, Lowell, when you're not in front of a computer trying to save the lives of pets and helping us be almost perfect pet parents. How's that? Well, you've met my family, so you know there is no spare time in my life. Yeah. What do you guys like? What's something fun you guys have done that you've enjoyed that got you away from the world of pets just for a moment? Well, as you know, we are pretty dynamic world travelers. Yep. All of us. <laughs> so haul the entire family 
Uh, a lot of it is when I lecture overseas and things like that, but we often uh, make some time. Uh, I think visits. that's cool. What I mean, have you figured out how many countries you've gone to or continents? Have you been to every continent yet? Well, I haven't been to Antarctica, but certainly okay. everywhere other than that. And nice. uh, probably closing in on uh, 80 countries or something okay. like that. Last question. When or why not? Would you try to be a contestant on Jeopardy? Well, <laughs> but you've I, I never actually, been asked that. I've never been asked that. And, you know, I much prefer um, watching others. I'm not sure I feel the need to do something like that myself. I prefer to, to share, share information like we're sharing information. All right. Hey, I am so happy that we've had Dr. Lowell Ackerman on our show He's a good guy. I already said that. He got that title. He's going to get a shirt probably that says, I'm a good guy. I know it. Um, I want you to check him out, Lowell Ackerman. Go to Amazon. Just type in his name. You're going to have a book or two or three that you feel like, yeah, I got to get my paws on because it's going to help me be a better pet parent to my pet. And I didn't even pop any peas. Woohoo! <laughs> I also want to thank my producer, Mark Winter. He is the surgeon of sound. He is the Wizard of Paws. Hey, um, everybody, check out Ardenmore.com when you get a chance. And until next time, this is your flea-free host, Arden Moore, delivering just two words to all you two, three, and four-leggers out there. Oh, behave. Coast to coast and around the world, it's all behave with Arden Moore. Find out why cats and dogs do the things they do and get the latest buzz from wagging tongues and tails in Rin Tin Tinseltown. From famous pet experts and best-selling authors to television and movie stars, you'll get great tail-wagging pet tips and have a fur-flying fun time. All behave with America's pet edutainer, Arden Moore, every week on demand, only on PetLifeRadio.com.